I'm, I'm so thankful that he thought enough of what the work we're doing at Holinsky's Hope to have us down here and talk to you guys. We're gonna take you through just you know, a little under an hour, sort of we wanna tell you about Tyler. Um, Kim's gonna come up with about 15 minutes left to tell you about Holinsky's Hope and the work we're doing there. And yeah, the idea is to, to try to give you some kind of understanding of who he was and, and we'll tell you why that's important. You may not think that's important as we talk about it, but this is not an easy talk to give. It's not an easy talk to hear. Um, but as we, we take you through this, this is slightly modified from the same version we give the kids. Um, so we wanted you to see what it is we're doing as well. So this may, think of this as the audience of being, you know, collegiate student athletes, high school student athletes. Um, so you know what the message is and the conversations we're having with them. It, there's no way to go through an hour and tell you about one kid, right? It's somebody that you love and care about. So we're gonna give you some stories that kind of go along with this. Um, but maybe the easiest one to do, and we do this for the kids as well, there's a lot of detail and stuff that you have to fill in the blanks yourself. Um, but we start off with a little video, let you walk through that. It takes about two minutes, so we'll come right back and get into our first Tyler talk here. His was a light that burned from within and shone out into the world in beams of joy that lit up everything around him. No, not, not one time. Um, have I ever seen him down? Ever. It really was this bright light in a room, and it almost as if the, the weight of the world was never on his shoulders. He always stood tall, he always had a smile on his, on his face. Breezy, bright smiles. His smile is beautiful. And when he smiles, his eyes get these little, like, lines. Laser beam throws. And I know that I'm going to be going to a great uh, program in Wazoo and playing for head coach Mike Leach. I can't wait. I'm excited. He is a really easygoing guy. He's everybody's type and moments of sheer electricity that ignited a legend. And he left and he, he went to Pullman because he loved the people. What he did on a Saturday night on the Palouse. <laughs> against Boise State, against all odds. Touchdown, Washington State! I mean, he played like Superman, like almost. Will be talked about forever. A rush of four, Helinski has his time. left. Clark made it, the catch made to the 20 yard line. More over the 10, runs for the win, dives for the pylon. Touchdown, Washington State. Touchdown, Washington State if it stands. The ruling on the field stands. Touchdown, Washington State. It's a comeback for the ages, an all time Cougar win. They carried him off the field that night under the lights. There were a lot of things right with Tyler Holinsky, but there was something wrong too, something dark and ominous that took hold of his soul and wouldn't let go. Finally just kind of op opened up and said, it, I'm sad, but it's, I can't base the sadness off anything. I can't pick one thing that I'm sad about. It's just an overwhelming sadness. That overwhelming sadness was depression, mental illness. A week after Tyler took his own life, hundreds and hundreds of people gathered at the Cougar statue in front of Martin Stadium. Not a word was spoken, but a thousand questions were asked, and they are still being asked. If even the brightest and the strongest are no match for the disease, what chance do the rest of us have? You know, if you have a sprained ankle, you know, you go see the trainer, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you get hit in the head, you got to go through a concussion protocol. Um, and we have to start to treat you know, some of this mental illness stuff the same way. But Tyler's light still shines. It shines on research and science. It shines on shattering stigmas, and it illuminates the mystifying darkness that surrounds mental illness. It's a path, a beacon. It's a hope. We call it Holinsky's Hope. You know, I should have mentioned also, there's going to be a lot of football talk and examples and stories, so uh, I'll apologize for that now. But that's, that's really what our boys did. That's what Tyler was. He was a quarterback, played football. That was his sport. Um, we spent the last three years telling people that you're much more than your sport, so you're going to hear that over and over again uh, today. But um, 
a lot of football stories just because that's where they're from. It doesn't make it more or less important. It's just just where we were. Um, so let me get into this a little bit with Tyler or about Tyler. Uh, Kim and I have three boys, Kelly, Ty, you saw Kelly in the video. My younger son, Ryan, used to play at USC. Now he plays at uh, Northwestern. He's up there right now, as a matter of fact. And those guys are um, A-type personalities. You know, they, when they walk in a room, you kind of know what kind of day they've had, what kind of day they're going to have, what day you're going to have. Um, but Tyler was a little different. He was um, more of a B-type personality, you know, passive to a certain extent. Um, between the lines in, in sports and stuff, he was hyper competitive, but he was, he was sort of the easygoing guy. He was a peacemaker in our family. So when you have three, uh, you know, there's never a tie. And so he was always the guy we could count on to sort of make sure everything went smoothly. Um, and he was, he was a really, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, he was a great athlete. You know, he did the things all you guys are doing. Um, working hard and first guy in the weight room last guy out those aren't just sayings those are some of the things that the guys practice and Tyler Tyler was one of those and we make this comment often you know there's nothing about mental health <clears throat> that sort of allows you not to be tough in your sport right the, you can't those aren't mutually exclusive you can be very tough and you can be hardworking and you can do all those things but if, if you're struggling with something that you know, you're thinking about hurting yourself or somebody else, um, that's a whole different world that you need to take care of. And <clears throat> Kim and I, we're not licensed mental health practitioners, we're not public speakers, we're simply telling a story and we think it's important because there's a lot of Tylers out there. You know, you hear this on every team, oh, they've, they've got some great leaders and some happy people and some talented players, et cetera. Um, and, and that was no different. But what we ask the kids often is, unless you've, unless you've had this in your family, unless you've struggled with mental illness yourself, or your family has, or you have a history of it, you know, what, what is the picture of that? What, is, what does mental illness mean to you? And you know, often they, they get those images from the media, whether TV or movies or the internet. You think of, uh, you know, some of the, the words that we use, we try to watch our words more carefully, but insane asylums, you know, does that picture come up? Does a, does a favorite movie come up? I can tell you what doesn't come up for them is a picture of Tyler. All right, this is, this is not the picture I think of when I, I hear that somebody's struggling with their mental health. It, I do now, of course. And, and we think that's, you know, we think that's really important because one of the reasons we use video often as well is when we lose younger kids to suicide, you get a, you know, a small black and white photo, usually the yearbook photo, and a eulogy or some comments below it. And it really, and then that's what you have, you know, that's just how it's done. Um, but we wanted to add more life because to us, Tyler was this beautiful, wonderful, happy, um, talented kid who was alive the day before he wasn't, you know, and, and every bit of that, going to practice and going to class and hanging out with his friends. And, and I think sometimes we, we, we confuse mental illness and mental health issues with people that are withdrawn and treating for years and suffering. Um, in this case, that, that's that pie chart of, of how you break those up. Tyler's in the smaller piece, um, a group of you know young people that don't tell you that they're struggling for whatever reason. He was uh, he was all these neat things, but he was hard on himself too. And as we as we give these talks, we we try to focus in on a couple of things because you know the number one question we get all the time is why isn't he here? What happened? And so we try to tell you through this story, but I can tell you right now, there's no end game where we give you the answer. We don't, we still don't know. I mean, that's, that's the truth of it. We still literally don't know. We know a lot more than we did now, or we know now than we did then. Um, but so one of those examples, I'll give you a couple, but one of those examples 
Um, nobody likes to lose, right? You don't want to fail a test. You don't want to break up with a girlfriend or boyfriend. Things, nasty stuff happens, and it's, you're sad about that stuff. It makes all the sense in the world. You're going on a new date or you're studying for a test, you're anxious about that stuff. But there's a big difference between clinical depression and clinical anxiety. I'm not the guy to tell you about it, but I'm just telling you there is. <clears throat> um, not a lot of people necessarily disagree with that. But in Tyler's case, as we look back on this, I can tell you too, we don't know, we know a couple things, what we would have done differently. Um, but one of the observations we made, and this just happens to be in this environment of, of collegiate sports, but after a loss that Tyler was involved in, his interviews with the media afterwards were really telling after he passed, right? So if, if you think back at looking at everything and trying to figure out what went wrong and when did it ha you know, when did he start struggling since he never told anybody, um, the video that you saw, a lot of that football was um, this great game. They played a triple overtime on the West Coast. It's like two in the morning or something, so you guys wouldn't have seen it. Um, but but they won this triple overtime game, and he was carried off the field. You know, you saw Drew Bledsoe in the video. They only happened twice in the history of the school. So he was at the highest height in September of 2017 in terms of sports. Had a girlfriend. Loved his teammates. Loved Mike Leach, if you can imagine that. Uh, enjoyed being with him um, uh, and his teammates. And, you know, I can tell you what those guys told us the same thing. If we had a list of roster of kids, Tyler would be on the bottom. He'd be the last kid we'd worry about. So, well, none of that does us any good. So what are we going to do about this? And Kim's going to come up and talk to you a little bit about Holinsky's hope. But... I think it's important to show that in Tyler's case, he wasn't, for whatever reason, he wasn't able to tell us, um, you know, hey, I'm struggling. So is that, is that unusual? Well, the young man in the video at the very beginning, big smile, tall kid, he played receiver for WSU, he was Tyler's roommate and Tyler's best friend, which Tyler had a lot of best friends. He, he loved you so much, you were his best friend. It didn't matter if he met you today or tomorrow or yesterday. But CJ was really that guy. <clears throat> and they lived together. So CJ's mother passed when he was five years old from cancer. And on occasion, we found this all out after Tyler passed. On occasion, he would go to a therapist, meet with a counselor, talk about it get some coping mechanisms and things to work on and so forth. And, and he told us the story that he would go every other Friday to the counselor up there in Pullman. He didn't have a car, so Tyler would drive him, drop him off, go get pizza or, you know, whatever, food of some sort, wait for him to be done 50 minutes later, sit in the parking lot, eat the food, and talk about this appointment. Now, here's a kid he loves, trusts, knows about, knows where the counselor is, knows that it helps. And you know, we're hearing this story relayed from CJ and you almost want to jump in the middle of it and say, why didn't he ask to go see, you know, hey CJ, maybe I should go talk to her too. But for some reason he couldn't, and, and whether that's stigma or awareness or combination of things, um, we're uncertain, but we'll tell you a little bit more about him. Um, so in these interviews that we watched, the games he lost, um, like I said before, you, you're unhappy about those things, but he was, he was to the point of almost being embarrassed, you know? Didn't matter how he did personally, but just losing and you, took it all on himself and, and we Kim and I watched these couple videos and um, he took it too hard. You know, uh, it's, it's one thing to be upset about it, but he really felt like he should be the guy to help win the thing. Just like the first huge game he played in was this triple overtime game. And they won. And then 
I was in September, early September, and late October, early November, they played Arizona. He was brought in after we were getting beat, brought the team back, threw for 504 yards and a half. Think about that. Four touchdowns, four interceptions. They lost by 10 points at the end. And there's some records in there that he set along the way, and you couldn't get past, hey, you know, I, I happened to be at that game. Kim was at the Boise State game. My arm around him, and he just, he was miserable. Well, when you haven't been in this position for three years, at the time, you think as a parent, this is part of it, and it's a struggle. Nobody wants to, to fail, <clears throat> and we've got to encourage him to, you know, to let it go, to move on to the next thing, control what you can control, all of those things. And we had those conversations with him. Um, but he didn't give any, you know, he was, he was, while he was the B type, he would tell you plenty of things. And he'd share stuff with you. But what we realized is he didn't really tell us how he felt about the things he was telling us, if that makes sense. He can relay a story, hey, this happened to practice today. Okay, or this happened at school, or I went on vacation, we went to Seattle with some friends and went fishing. But I never really, again, overthinking this a lot, um, after he passed, we didn't know, we didn't know what, what he thought about those things, right, if that makes sense. We didn't know what he was thinking at the time. Um, and that, that, that makes you, it's sad, guys. Like, you know, it's sad, it's hard to hear, it's hard to think about. But what we realized when we talked to his teammates and some administrators and some coaches, this is prevalent in our sports society. And if there was anything we were going to do to honor Tyler, it would be to try to figure out what happened to him and prevent it from happening again. Well, when you don't know exactly what happened, it's harder to do that. As we continue to do work and uncover um, information, we felt like there's a very good chance Tyler, <clears throat> Tyler had no intention of telling anybody. You know, this was his thing to solve and his problem to fix. And it's very unlikely that, uh, that he was going to be able to do that. Was, was it because of stigma? Was he afraid of losing his job? Possibly. Um, was he embarrassed? You know, it could be. And, you know, you expect somebody to get up here that loves his kids to tell you what a great kid he is. But we, he wasn't perfect, obviously. He was perfect to us. We loved him, and he was... He was just the greatest kid. And what we often say is, we just wish you could have met him. You'd understand, if you knew him, you'd understand why we're here. This is not a political statement of any kind. But uh, we live now in South Carolina. And if you have guns and you go hunting and fishing, we just ask you to take care of them responsibly. Most people that we talk to that are gun owners do that. Um, Tyler died by firearm. I'm going to walk you through that day a little bit just to, so you can understand what, what we think happened. Um, there's a lot of nasty stuff that happens when your son dies. Uh, you have to talk to a coroner. You have to, talk, you have to do paperwork. You have to meet with the police. You have to meet a lot of unhappy people when you're you know, beyond help at that point. And one of the first things Kim and I did uh, when we got up there is we had to meet with the coroner. And I can't, you know, you don't recall everything vividly, but I remember at one point she said, very early on, she said, I, uh, Mr. Linsky, I want you to know that Tyler took his life in a way that wouldn't hurt anybody else. And I don't know why that one stands out among all the other things, but she she said that, and I, I remember just being furious. Like, who? he was well enough to make sure he, no one else got hurt physically. He destroyed our family. So that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What, what kind of you know, decision-making was he capable of at that time? Um, but I'll tell you why I say that later. <clears throat> and there's things like that. You, know, you, have to, you have to go through some difficult things. Um, 
he left a note, and we've never made that public because it, it doesn't really help. It's, it's not a dear mom or dad letter. It's not a here's why I had to leave. Um, unfortunately, it was um, you know, logistical in nature. and didn't, didn't make any sense for him to, to have written it or for us to, to share it. So you can imagine, in, in, first you're devastated because you're missing the person you love so much. And then you immediately start to ask, how in the world could this happen? Now, Tyler wasn't perfect. He was a, he was a bad driver. <laughs> um, it, you know, and so when, when we got, I got a phone call from Coach, is how this you know, started. And he said, hey, uh, I got to talk to you. Tyler missed practice. It was like 2.30 in the afternoon. Tyler missed practice, and he's missing. Like, this is all stumbling out of his mouth, you know. And it was, a, it was a recruiting coordinator coach that made the call. Malich was on a plane on his way back from Tennessee, I think. Um, but he, so he, he told us Tyler was missing. Tyler had missed practice ever, right? It just wasn't a thing for him. It didn't make him good or bad. He just didn't do it. So that immediately raised the bar of concern. And he said the second thing he said at least the second thing I heard was, we're going to file a missing persons report. Now, this has all happened like in 10 minutes, you know, whatever, 30 seconds of the phone call, before which we just thought, hey, you know, we're going to see him next week or the week after or whatever. And so it all came uh, obviously very quickly. And we think, you know, ultimately, we think they knew what happened already when they called us and didn't know how to how to say it, um, we found out very shortly after that that they found him. So let me tell you about it just, just so you understand and hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, Ty, so Tyler went out, this is a, a Friday, Saturday. He went out with some guys. We, he grew up in California. We were born and raised in California. Never had a lo loaded firearm. Is, Teammates and, and roommates said, hey, let's go out. We're going to shoot skeet. You know, they throw these things in the air and shoot them out. Um, you know, clean fun, whatever. And so they did. They went out to the middle of the desert, shot a bunch of skeet um, or clay pigeons or whatever those things are. And, and they were, when they were done, they put the guns back in this, you know, duffel bag, put it in the car, and they all went their separate ways. Well, there was an AR-15 in that bag and a bunch of shells that went missing, right? So they went shooting. They all went home. The owner of the guns called Tyler and said, we don't know what happened to this AR-15. It's just missing. Oh, man, hang on. I'll come over and look. Must be, must be there somewhere. So he runs over to the new apartment he's moving into, goes through the place looking for it. Meanwhile, it's in his truck. Now. Tyler had money in his bank, gas in his car, food in his stomach. He didn't need, he wasn't going to go sell it. He wasn't going to hurt anybody, I hope. And his teammates never for a minute thought, <laughs> maybe Tyler has it because he's not doing very well, right? That's the awareness piece we have to beat up on. Um, three days later is when he used it. So. He sat on it for a few days. And if that, <clears throat> you know, thinking about what he went through and how he died is tough enough, what was he doing the few days before that? Right? He was thinking about it. He was struggling with it. Crying himself to sleep or, or screaming or whatever. You know, you just, your mind goes a lot of places. But this kid was perfect at telling you everything was all right. When we got up there, of course, was we went through his, we found his laptop and his iPad right away. We got into those right away, and the laptop, I'll spare you the, you know, laptop had some schoolwork on it, and his iPad had a bunch of football on it. We couldn't find his phone. It wasn't on his person, it wasn't in his apartment that we were aware of. Kim and I went outside and searched the, anything that, a you know, an iPhone can fall in, we looked. Couldn't find it. And again, you know, keep in mind, we're looking for something 
and not, not processing Tyler's never coming back. So we left. Oh, the reason we were looking for it, of course, was to find out why. Maybe there's something there. Maybe he was searching for something. Maybe he was talking to somebody. Maybe he texted somebody. Um, and so, you know, we went home without it. And Kim got a call from the chief of police and, who said, hey, Ms. Slinsky, we found Tyler's phone. Wait, six months later? Where was it? Oh, it was in his apartment. And yeah, I tell the kids, in the Pacific Northwest, it's cold. And so they have these little heaters, you know, they, that line up against the wall. They look like long toasters, and just radiant heat comes out of them. So he had slipped that in and just dropped it in there. And I had his ID in it and his coog card and some money. And that was the last thing he had. You know, besides that AR-15, that was the last thing he was holding. Like, what? Was he hiding it? Who knows? But obviously, he didn't want somebody to find it. Um, sorry, I know I need to speed this up. Um, We had the phone sent to us. We plugged it in, charged it, and uh, we couldn't get in it. Now, Ty among other things, Tyler, um, his <laughs> passwords are one, two, three, four. You know, uh, all ones, or what are all T's or something. And so it was unusual for one of him or me or his brothers or his girlfriend not to know what that password is. Now, there's a break in the story because we send this out to get open is what we need. We need to get open without the data being destroyed. And you have to understand, we think this is the answer, right? This is going to tell us what really happened. And <clears throat> again, a much longer story, but it's very difficult to do this without destroying it. So we were able to find that company. That company was very helpful, though they don't work with individual people. They work with the FBI and so forth. And they broke the phone, <clears throat> they passcode and said, hey, we got it. They took all the data off, put it in a big drive, hyperlinked a bunch of stuff to pictures and videos and um, so forth, and said, here's all of it. You know, we'll send it back to you. So we get it back. <clears throat> As we look at it, what I remember is there's this little yellow sticky tag on the face of the phone, and it said PW, you know, password, and it had six numbers underneath. Like, those don't, like, just intuitively, they didn't make any sense. They don't fit the pattern of it. You know, it's not across, down, up, and over, or whatever. And so that's strange. What, what was he? At that time, we didn't know it. But later, we found out he had changed that password a couple days before he died. So that made more sense. It, so we put a lot of effort into that. And, and Kim and my sister, I remember, I was on the road. And they called me, and they crying. And they said, I think. There's only one English language word that fits this, and that is sorry. I'm not telling you he wrote sorry <clears throat> for us, but what I can tell you is there was some thought there. And I think when you're desperate, you know, you, you look for that stuff. <clears throat> but either way, whether he was sorry about something and entered that in every time his phone didn't work or, you know, shut down, or he left it as a message for us, it just speaks to volumes of he couldn't write a note, he couldn't call, he couldn't ask his friend, he couldn't tell his coach what he was really struggling with. And for anybody to live through that, to not die by suicide, that is a difficult life. So we decided, you know, and Kim's going to share this with you, we decided to do something about that. And <clears throat> I told you that story about the coroner um, because one of the other things she said was, you know, people that die by, especially young kids that die by suicide, at 20, he, Tyler was 21, um, and he, uh, as I mentioned, never, never talked to anybody, never told anybody he was struggling, didn't appear to be, right? was healthy. He was a college athlete and playing the game that he loved with the people he loved. 
And she told me, you know, Tyler, the kids of those age don't really want to die. They just want to be out of that pain. And, you know, that's hard to, it's hard to imagine what, how much pain that is, right, to, to go that way. Um, I think there's a couple other, uh, you know, pieces that, that may or may not be meaningful. Um, we try to stay out of the statistics of this stuff and humanize and tell you the story about a kid seemingly had everything and is no longer with us. And then I, I was, Kim and I were mailed this stata, uh, statistic from one of the former players. It was really this first line of this PowerPoint, <clears throat> the second leading cause of death. Now we know they're, you know, they're younger, they don't have disease process to fight with and so forth, but these aren't kids. You guys aren't kids at 21 that decided, I've done everything, I've seen it all, I had a good life, it's time for me to go. That's not the decision-making process you, you need at 21. Suicide is not an answer to any of that, obviously. But for somebody that has it all together, you would think, oh, of course, they're gonna get to that final stage, you know? Yeah, I lost a bowl game. Yeah, I broke up with a girlfriend. I got a parking ticket. You don't add those together and say, well, when that happens, people die from suicide, right? We sit in here, there's hundreds of kids. We say, Raise your hand if you ever had a you know, parking ticket, got a C on a test, you know, got yelled at by a coach. Of course, that's the college experience. So there's more to that. There's much more to that. And, and what we found was, and, and I hope you can appreciate this, we're pretty good at ACLs, right? And, and, and orthopedic injuries, we're made unbelievable strides. But we don't treat mental health with the same care and conviction yet. And I think that's, that's putting our youth at risk. Women's volleyball, uh, men's diving. I mean, we've heard from every group you know, at every level, and they're, they've all experienced that. And you can read some of the others yourself, but the second one is 25% of all college students will experience a clinical evaluation of depression or anxiety in those four years they're, in, they're on campus. So it's way bigger than we thought. And all those don't end in suicide, and this, we don't tell the kids this to scare anybody. It's simply to just be aware, have a little more kindness, you know, <clears throat> and compassion. We don't, Kim and I don't say um, committed suicide anymore either because seems seems like yesterday, sit up here and gave Tyler's eulogy and at the end, <clears throat> someone came up and said, my son asked me, what did you mean Tyler really didn't do this? And I, and you know, it's a much more complex question, but it wasn't the Tyler I knew that solved his problems this way. We've got to do a better job because depression and anxiety are treatable, you know, survivable. Um, bipolar. The, this is something that you can get better from. And we gotta recognize when we have it, we gotta recognize in those that, that have it and that are unable to tell us and do a better job of, of helping those uh, student athletes. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. Kim's gonna tell you a little bit about Holinsky's Hope. There's a last video we asked you to th sit through. It was, a, it's almost a highlight video, but it's set to the, this great song that, um, Washington State had for the football team, and, and we like it a lot, so we hope you enjoy that. I could never do what Mark just did and stand up in front of you for 45 minutes without breaking down or falling to my knees. Um, you know, it's a struggle every single day. He was not only my son, he was my buddy. and. I tell people all the time, yes, I, I love my children, but really, I'm in love with my children. And I, I made shirts for us. I was, you know, it was a fun family thing. And, and one year, I, I made a shirt for 
all of us, and mine read, um, I'm in love with four men, my, my three sons and my husband, and that's the truth. Um, they mean everything to me. So when Tyler died, um, I, you know, I was at a loss. What do you do with that love that you have for someone? It doesn't go away. It stays with you and it actually continues to grow. And so I, I took that love along with Mark and our two sons and so many wonderful people and we formed Helinski's Hope. Um, it really is a way to honor Tyler and in doing so help others. And our oldest son, Kelly, he was the, the blonde in the video. He looks a lot like me. Um, he put this quote up on his Twitter wallpaper and he did it years before Tyler died. And it, you know, it, I say it to myself every day and it's a promise that I will keep um, to Tyler. It goes this way. They say you die twice. The first time when you take your last breath and the second time when someone says your name for the last time. And our promise to Tyler is that we will not let him die twice. We will continue to share his story and it's not easy. Um, but the thing about it is, I get to say his name many times when I share his story. I get to think about Tyler. I get to remember that sweet smile. And, and Mark is right, he was just a ray of sunshine. Um, it, it was that kind of face where you looked at it and everything that was heavy was gone just because you looked into his eyes. So Tyler got sick and we didn't know. And it really eats at me I couldn't save my son, and, and you know as parents that you would do anything to save your children. Anything. So I also made a promise that I was going to work to save other lives, um, to let people know, our student athletes know, that they are not alone, that they shouldn't struggle in silence. So we formed Helensky's Hope in our mission, and, and if you notice, Three, it was Tyler's jersey number, um, and it's sort of in everything that we do. The first is to raise awareness, and, and um, you know, it's mental health, concussions, CTE. Um, it's not talked about enough. Uh, you know, Mark talked about how we, we talk about our orthopedic issues, broken bones, ACLs. Um, I always took my kids to the doctors for that. I mentioned earlier that one of my sons had two ACL avulsion fractures, and we we're at the doctor almost every couple of weeks doing that. I have a, a son, my older son, that has four anchors in his shoulder. You know, we we're always at the doctor for that. But we didn't talk about mental health because really we didn't see it. But it was there, we just didn't know. And so that awareness part by talking about it, by sharing Tyler's story, we're trying to raise that. And then the second part of our mission is to eradicate the stigma, and Mark mentioned it. Um, athletes, student athletes, are supposed to be strong, right? Invincible. You pay, play through that grind, you know? We know what it's like. You wake up early, maybe you do homework. Um, or study for a test before you go to practice. You go to practice before school, or you lift, you go to school, you practice after school, you come home and you do it all over again, and that's a sacrifice. And I applaud you for what you give to your sport. Um, but reaching out and, and asking for help, letting people know that you are struggling, that you're anxious because maybe you lost a game or you're, you're anxious for the game that's coming up that Friday or Saturday night, there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. And you sure, certainly shouldn't be afraid of losing your job because you reached out to your coach to let him know that, that you're going through something. So that stigma should not be there. We're, we're beating it down. We're gonna eliminate it. It should be on par with taking care of your physical health. It absolutely should. 
And then the third part of our mission was, yes, we want to do those two very important things, but um, education is, is very important to us as well. So yeah, we tell you, you need to take care of your mental health, but then how do you do it? You're taught from a very young age how to eat properly, right? The right vegetables, the fruit, how much you should sleep, um, you know, it, but are you really ever taught how to take care of your mental wellness? And we think it's all connected. It's mind, body, soul. It all goes together. And the sports psychologists that we work with, um, they also say that taking care of your mental health will make you a better performer in your sport as well, right? You'll perform better on the field or on a court if you're actually taking care of your mental wellness. Um, we don't think Tyler knew he was struggling. And if he did, I think um, he didn't know how to reach out and ask for help. So one of the programs that we work with and, and the, the coaches that are listening and the student athletes that are out there and any administrators that are listening, um, we can talk to you about bringing these programs that I'm going to mention to you. The first is Step Up. It's a peer-to-peer -peer bystander intervention group. And, and what it does is it teaches the teammates, the friends, the peers, how to look for subtle changes in your friends and your teammates. You know, um, if Tata was sleeping too much, if he started partying, it, and you see these changes, um, you know, if there's an eating disorder going on, um, it teaches the teammate how to look for those changes and how to respond appropriately and, and how to find help for that person. And then the next program that we work with is called Behind Happy Faces. And, you know, that's what we're talking about. You know, Tyler with that happy face on, but behind it, he was struggling and he really didn't know what to do. And so it teaches you how to take care of your own mental health. So we blend those two programs um, and, and we think they're really important. There has to be an educational tool. Um, we've gone and talked to, I don't know, it's over 100 schools or so now. And, um, you know, I get emails the next day or I get texts or I get, you know, moms and dads reaching out to me or coaches or ADs um, or doctors. And one of the things that we say in our Tyler Talks um, is that if you are struggling and you don't know how to start that conversation with someone, you don't know how to reach out for help, use Tyler's story. And so the people that respond to me after our talks will say, Mrs. Helensky, I, I did what you asked. I, I sat down with my mom and I said, you know, I was at this talk tonight and they shared a story about their son that passed by suicide and he was struggling and, and mom, I, I'm struggling as well. So if you're out there and you don't know how to ask for help, please start with, with Tyler's story. It, it would actually mean a lot to me and I know Tyler is watching and, and um, it would mean a lot to him too. And know that there is, there is always help and that there is always hope. And our family and our foundation is here for you. And we appreciate you student athletes and we appreciate you for having us here and letting me tell you about my beautiful son. It means a lot. Um, we started something um, this past football season. It, it really took off in the SEC and it was called College Football Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, hashtag three day, there's that number three. And it was one of our ways of raising awareness and also reducing the stigma. And what happened was in a stadium of 100,000 people, in the first play of the third quarter, everyone would stand up and we'd say that it's the, the loudest silence you've ever heard. And the first person I ever saw do it was Nick Saban, who was standing right in front of us alongside of us football players. And South Carolina is playing Alabama at home. 
And um, everybody stands up and, and raises three fingers. And the beauty of that is that, yes, it's Totter's number, it's three, but really it lets those players on the field know and every player in that stadium, every athlete, and those watching on television that we love you, we support you, and we appreciate all you do to bring us, your fans, so much enjoyment. And the other wonderful thing about it is, and we've heard this many times, is there'll be a dad there and his, his younger daughter or son is, is standing next to him and they're not really sure what's going on and they ask, you know, dad or mom, what are we doing? Why are we standing up? Why is, why is it gone quiet? And the dad will say, oh, this is about mental health. Let's start talking about our mental health. So it's a way to start a conversation and again, let our student athletes know how awesome we think they are. And awesome was um, Tyler's favorite word, by the way. So um, I want you to remember what I've told you tonight. And I don't want you to remember my sad Tyler, the one that's gone, because I still think he's here with us. I, I actually think he's in this room trying to keep me from crying. But I'd like you to remember him this way. I'm gonna need you to raise your glass I don't care what you put in it Here's the nights that you can't take back We live hard but we love to laugh We all thought that we'd get rich fast Hop the plane out for greener grass Found out the green is cash Don't compare to the friends at last See we won't forget where we came from The city won't change us We beat to Touchdown wins it. Snap back to Hilinski. Drops back. Has time. Passes left. Caught made at the catch mid of the 20-yard line. More over the 10. Runs for the win. Dives for the pylon. Touchdown, Washington State. He's celebrating like it was over the goal line. It's a comeback for the ages. An all-time Cougar win. Down 21 in the fourth quarter. Washington State. Yes. Hey. La, la, la.
right, that's it for us guys. Um, we're grateful to be here and, you know, it was, it's tough to reflect as you're doing these um, and we wanted to give you some of the information that we give the kids. But at the end of the day, you know, if you have a gut feeling about something that you, you can't pinpoint, um, you know, it's our, our recommendation that you pursue it because at the end, um, as we go back through it today in the last three years, there, Tyler was sick and, and struggling and as his parents, we should have figured that out. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, pain that goes with thinking that way. Um, but in the, in the interim, uh, you know, they, the questions we get the most are, you know, what, what do you, what advice do you have? And, you know, I would recommend you don't take our advice, right, because of the position we're in. But I recognize the importance of the question. And, and the only answer that's real, for me at least, is, you just couldn't put your finger on it. Something was wrong. And you push, and you know, I'm good, I'm great, I'm this. The part Kim and I lacked was the awareness and the understanding of how lethal not finding that out was. Um, I w I'm gonna end at least, you know, blathering on about Tyler this way. When Kim and I, one of the other million stories when Kim and I were up there, we wanted to talk to the team and, and part of the reason I wanted to talk to the team is I had a message to give them, which was, don't think any less of Tyler because he died by suicide. I said, if you can think about it. I was trying, the kid was gone. Everything in our world blew up. And I was still, you know, in my head, oh, geez, he, he's not a bad kid. He's a great kid. We miss him. He's a... And that was the mess I was trying to give. And, and you, you play that back enough times and you think there's stigma right there. He's gone. Who cares how he left? We'll figure that stuff out later. Um, but the last month or so, a lot of changes had occurred in Tyler's life. Good change. You know, he was now the starter for this team. And, um, and so when he got a little quieter and he got a little shorter on his messages and I called him out on that. And I'll never forget, he, he said, oh, we call each other big, but that's, he said, I'd never bail on you big. Yeah. How much that hurts today, thinking of bailing on, I mean, it's the worst bail in history, right? I think Kim and I put this together all not that long ago, when I tell you the story about CJ, it was Tyler's thinking, my guess, that he didn't have a reason to be sad. CJ's mom died. You know, you, my mom died. I'm sad. Of course you are. That's why he's going. This, this is a conversation I have with him. That's why he went. He was, had a reason. I'm sad, I can't get out of bed, I can't go to sleep, or what, whatever those things that we didn't know were going on, I can almost bet a dollar that that would have been his answer. And that, you know, he's just not meant to be here for some reason. That, that escalation happens in 100 days. Um, and so we, we try to share that. I know, it, I know it's a tough story, I get it. I'm sorry about that part. But I also, you know, wish his teammate had been in this room, you know, his coaches had listened a little bit or the parents if they, they were able, because it's going to take all of that and more uh, to get better at this. So thank you guys for listening and putting up with us and thanks so much.